It's been a while since I've tested any MSI products, but it seems that I've returned to a pretty decent pick. This is the MPG 331QRF-QD, a 32-inch, 1440p, 175Hz, rapid IPS, quantum dot monitor. And while it has some quirks for sure, it also seems to be a pretty standout option in this space. It lists top shelf specs and makes some interesting claims, so let's take a look. But first, a message from this video sponsor, Lexar. Their NM760 PCIe Gen 4x4 SSD is a budget-friendly drive that sports a brand new, efficient 12 nanometer controller, up to 5.3 gigabytes per second in reads and 4.5 gigabytes per second in writes, a petabyte written rating, and a five-year warranty. The NM760 will fit in almost anything, including the PS5, so pick up yours today at the link in the description below. I'll start off with what makes this one special, the quantum dots. In essence, they are a sort of film that absorbs relatively noisy light and outputs a much cleaner wavelength. That means the colour reproduction is astonishingly accurate and allows an otherwise standard panel to cover an incredibly wide colour gamut. In this case, this thing can cover over 100% of the Adobe RGB colour space, around 95% of the DCI-P3 spectrum, which is one of the best performances I've seen, especially from what is just a, a gaming monitor. Sadly, out of the box, it wasn't perfectly accurate, with an average Delta E of around 3.9. That still isn't bad, although sub 2 is really what you're looking for there for perfect accuracy. Happily, a simple calibration can bring that to an average of 0.7, so if you care about accuracy of your colours, then make sure to calibrate your displays every once in a while. That wide gamut coverage means that content looks pretty fantastic on this. You can expect rich, vibrant colours in whatever you're watching or playing. The only catch is the brightness. While it's nowhere near as low as the Acer XB273UNV I reviewed recently, I only measured this at a peak of around 350 nits, not the 400 that they quote. That also means that the contrast ratio was only 550 to 1, not the 1000 to 1 that they quote as well, especially thanks to relatively bright black levels. While I don't think that it's exactly a deal breaker, it is a bit of a shame that despite such vibrant colours, the darker areas do tend to stand out, especially when you're in a darker environment surrounding your monitor. If you only use this, you know, during the day with the lights on, then you probably won't mind as much, but for any lights off midnight gaming, it might make it uh, a bit more obvious. That does also mean that HDR is uh, kind of off the table, it's, it's a no-go zone here, as even with the quoted 600 nit peak brightness in HDR, the black levels would kill the contrast instantly and then squash back down that dynamic range. Now since we're talking about gaming, let's cover the whole rapid IPS thing. MSI quotes this as having a 1 millisecond greater response type, and if there is Anything, just one thing that I can assure you of, is that this does not have a one millisecond response type. No way. Even using the worst possible testing methodology, the highest overdrive setting, which yes, overshoots past what should be full wides, measuring a tiny transition and ignoring the overshoot time itself, that still comes out to two milliseconds. That is the best case. Realistically, with overdrive on its lowest normal setting, you can expect an average of more like 8 milliseconds, with the best case being around 5.1. No overshoot though, which is nice, although that's kind of to be expected with overdrive effectively off. On its fast setting, that actually drops the average rather nicely to more like 6.4 milliseconds, still free from overshoots, although the falling transitions, the, the light to dark transitions, are still pretty slow. On fastest, the highest level of overdrive, you actually see longer perceived response times thanks to a pretty noticeable amount of overshoot. 
it isn't the worst for sure. Uh, I've definitely seen worse by far, but it is probably a mode that I would avoid as it ends up making the visual experience just a touch worse in my, my personal opinion. I would generally recommend the middle fast option as the best choice if you have one of these monitors. That's also confirmed with the high speed footage of the UFO test where on the fast mode you can see it mostly falls within the refresh rate window, meaning a new frame will be fully drawn and nice and crisp before the next frame needs to start drawing itself. Compare that to the fastest mode, and while it does generally render the frame just a little bit faster, you do get an extra millisecond or two of overshoot behind the newest frame, sort of inverse ghosting, which isn't ideal. Still, when actually gaming on it, I must admit that this was a pretty decent experience. The 175Hz refresh rate is nice, obviously not quite as good as the 240Hz options that are already on the market, but it's plenty enough for me. For fast-paced FPS games, I can't say that this is the ideal monitor, for sure. I, I can't say this is the, the next um, eSports professional display, but if you're just a, a casual player like, well, most of us, then I see nothing wrong with using this. For more visually oriented or visual quality driven games, I think this is an excellent fit. The mix of vibrant colours, crisp resolution, fast refresh rate and reasonably fast response times does make for a pretty great experience. As for the physical features, MSI opted for a screw attachment option for the stand. This isn't a deal breaker for sure, I mean you only need to build it once generally, and they have gone with the slightly nicer option of being able to slot the display on the hooks at the top edge of the sort of mounting plate and then you just have to use screws to hold in the bottom side. I would prefer a toolless latching mechanism like most other monitors but I guess this is still fine enough. As for the stand itself you have all of the adjustment that you would expect. Everything from height tilt and swivel, although sadly no portrait mode rotation, although for a 32 inch monitor that's pretty standard. The stand's base plate is pretty massive, they've opted for the large flat plate design rather than the three long legs option, which depending on how you have your desk set up, you might actually prefer this still semi-functional surface rather than just the legs kind of getting in the way of everything. So it's kind of up to you, also does give a nice amount of stability. As for the styling, I don't think it's too bad. They've gone with a very subtle MSI logo at the bottom, right above the ambient light sensor that looks a hell of a lot like a permanently attached webcam staring at you. Uh, half, happily it's not, it is just an ambient light sensor, don't worry too much. Uh, the back has a small RGB strip, it's not really bright or big enough to reflect off of a wall, so unless you, you know, actively see the back of the monitor regularly, as in it's not pressed up against your wall, I would probably just turn that off, save the power, and why bother? IO wise, you get two HDMI 2.0 ports, one DisplayPort 1.4 port, and USB-C with DisplayPort Alt mode, uh, which you can use as part of their KVM feature alongside the standard uh, USB 3.2 Gen 1, so standard USB 3 hub, and the three USB 3 ports, two of which are on the left hand side, along with microphone and headphone jacks. Interestingly, they include slots at the bottom of the, the chin bar for a mouse bungee accessory, which sadly doesn't seem to have come with my review unit. When it comes to the on-screen menu, this is a, it's a bit of a weird one. They've definitely made some interesting choices here. Now it does use the standard sort of hat switch or joystick stick switch at the back to navigate the menu, which is great. But the menu is definitely a little strange in its layout, with many of the feature names really giving you no clue what they actually do. The first menu is called GI, which is MSI speak for Gaming Intelligence, which is itself marketing speak for AI enhanced smart features. The manual is absolutely full of just gibberish about these features, like the auto brightness control a feature that's been on monitors for the better part of like two decades at this point. They say it uses a, an AI algorithm to adjust the brightness based on ambient light level. Yeah, sure. The same goes for the smart crosshair, where again, 
Through AI algorithm, this function enhances the visibility of in-game crosshair. As in, they do a check to see what colors are around the crosshair that they add in, and then change the color so it stays visible. Cool idea, stupid marketing speak. Moving down to the, the gaming tab, this is where you'll find your overdrive settings, labeled as response time. You'll also find a setting called MPRT Sync, which is their backlight strobing mode, which much like ASUS's ELMB Sync setting, can in theory be set to active with adaptive sync, although uh, you have to be running at 85 FPS or higher for it to work, and it also dims the display considerably because, well, it's strobing the backlight on and off. It's also equally just generally bad for your eyes, and I can't use it, I get headaches almost instantly, so I would leave that one off, personally. Under the Professional tab, the next one down, you'll find the Pro Modes, which actually are pretty cool. They clamp the panel to sRGB, Adobe RGB, or DCI-P3. That is a big step up from most displays that only offer the very naff sRGB color space, so good job there. As for the um, image enhancement, uh, that's just turning the sharpness up to 11, so best to leave that one off as well. Finally, you'll want to head all the way down to the second page, which only has one option called setting, and then you want to head all the way down to the bottom of that section to turn on DisplayPort overclocking so that you can actually run the thing at 175 hertz. Okay, so what do I actually think of this thing? Well, on the whole, I'm pretty impressed. The quantum dot layer does a fantastic job at cleaning up that light and allowing the panel to cover a genuinely wide color gamut. It is a shame that the black light level seems so high and that the brightness isn't all that impressive, but the actual viewing experience wasn't what I would call compromised, so on the whole, not too bad. Gaming on it felt pretty good. It's not the fastest panel in the world, for sure, it sure as hell isn't a one millisecond panel, but it generally falls within the refresh rate window, so for the average gamer, this is perfectly fine. The menu is a little strange, but on the whole, I would say that it's a pretty good shout. The only catch is the price tag, as Overclocks UK have this listed at £50 more than the Gigabyte M27Q-X x the 240Hz 1440p IPS option, or £150 more than the M32Q, their 32-inch 165 option instead, both of which offer a very similar, or in some regards better, experience, and both for less money, with the direct competitor, the M32Q, being substantially cheaper. I'm not sure that I could recommend this at this price. If it was closer to the M32Q, then sure, it's a fair game. But for 40% more money? Yeah, no thanks. With that said, those are my thoughts, but I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think of the uh, MPG321QRF-QD? Is it a monitor you pick up yourself? Would you pick up the M32Q instead, or maybe the M27Q-X, uh, or something else entirely? Feel free to let me know in the comments down below. If you want to check out the monitor, I'll leave a global Amazon affiliate link to it in the description where you can check that out, and probably an Overclocks UK link as well since they're selling it at a much more reasonable price than Amazon is, so feel free to take a look. And uh, otherwise, that's kind of it. If you want to see more videos from me, you can hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. If you want to see more of the existing videos on the channel, there are plenty, so take a look at those and the end cards when they pop up in a second. And if you want to support the channel and keep me making these videos, then there's a load of ways you can do that through YouTube itself, becoming a YouTube member, Patreon if you want to become a patron and get some cool rewards either way. You can just uh, sign up to our Discord and come and have a chat, or you can get some Discord-specific rewards if you, uh, you know, fancy supporting. And there's also stuff like merch for hoodies or t-shirts like this one, or a load of other non-sweaty designs. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it. Sorry for the car going by, we'll see you on the next video.